My name is Jonathan Williams, and uh, I'm a writer and uh, publisher, uh, sort of photographer, and designer of books. Those are the things I do most of the time. Um, I've lived uh, in this house on and off since uh, 1942. So that tends to put me among the people who've lived in Scaly quite a long time, quite a long time. Uh, that came to pass because my father, Ben Williams, was a native of uh, Hendersonville, North Carolina, and uh, worked in uh, Washington, D.C. and. Uh, he had never been to Highlands until um, uh, 1941, I believe. He was driving my mother down to Atlanta to visit her parents who lived in the West End. My grandfather was a banker uh, at the First National Bank for 50 years, I believe. And uh, as they got just about where we're sitting on the highway, uh, Suddenly you had a big, big view of the Nantahala Mountains, which he noticed. And uh, as soon as he took my mother to Atlanta, he turned around and came back and sought out the landowner and bought some land uh, just to make newcomers feel terrible. Uh, he bought the land here for $50 an acre. and. The farmer was very happy because he had bought the land for like nine dollars an acre. So he was, you know, he had f fooled the city slicker and he was way ahead. Well, as I say, I was here because of my parents uh, who used this as a summer house back in the 40s. And uh, I was going to St. Albans School in Washington, D.C. And uh, every summer I'd come down here. Well, when I graduated in 1947 and headed for Princeton, my father decided they would pull up stakes in Washington and, and move here permanently, much to the distress of my mother who liked cities and liked shopping and all those things. And you wouldn't find much of that in Scaly Mountain in 1942. Anyway, they managed and uh, so, off to college, I dropped out of Princeton pretty quickly because everybody looked like James Baker, who was actually in the class of 1950. I'm sorry, class of 48. I was class of 47. There he was, already looking terrifying. I didn't want any part of it, so I, I dropped out, sort of entered the art world, studied in New York with Stanley William Hayter, the English engraver. Then I went to uh, the Institute of Design in Chicago and studied with some very interesting people. Hugo Weber, who had been the assistant to uh, Aristide Maillol, the sculptor, and was an interesting artist. And uh, a woman who had been an assistant to Jan Tischholt, who was a great, great, uh, typographer who was at the Bauhaus in Germany. And uh, so I was sort of getting used to uh, some of the graphic arts. And uh, at that time, I wanted to study with Harry Callahan, the photographer. And it was a spring semester. And he said, well, the only people I'm teaching this, this uh, term are people who've worked with me for about a year and know how to use a camera. And he said, do you know how to use a camera? He said, I've hardly ever had one in my hands. So he said, I tell you what, um, I'm going to be at a place called Black Mountain College uh, this summer. And is that anywhere near where you live? And uh, I said, well, it's within 100 miles. I'll see what I can do. So that's why I went to Black Mountain College, uh, not because of Charles Olson, 
with whom I was barely familiar. I, I knew him as a man who'd written a book about Melville, and I knew nothing about his poetry or teaching or anything. So Black Mountain was, first of all, Callahan <clears throat> and his friend who came from New York to join him, named Aaron Siskind. So there they were. I mean, they were two of the best American photographers ever. And uh, for a summer, I had, you know, practically total attention from them. So wonderful. And then Charles Olson was kind of thrown in, you know, for change. And uh, again, an unbelievable person. Uh, first of all, he was the largest poet that the world has known. He was about six feet nine, weighed about 300 usually. Enormous. And, you know, just on a physical level, he was uh, overwhelming. I don't know what he was plugged into, but he was plugged in and uh, had enormous energy and uh, was uh, f fascinating on every occasion to be in his presence. In the 50s, I began uh, big, big travels around the United States trying to uh, show people uh, books by small presses. Uh, City Lights in San Francisco, for instance, which uh, published a variety of books, uh, including some by people like Ginsburg, Allen Ginsburg. So I had a station, old station wagon of my father's that I filled with books and just took off. I wrote cards telling colleges mostly and some sort of art centers uh, that I was prepared to come and and uh, talk to them, show them books. No, no fee, just if they'd give me some time so I could do this. So I did that for <clears throat> something like seven months in the 1958. And uh, I'm sorry, it's 57, 57. I was traveling from uh, Washington State all the way to Maine and I covered the country and just gave hundreds, well, hundreds, not just on that occasion, but during the 50s, hundreds and hundreds of uh, readings, talks. The Appalachian Trail is to be viewed out this window. So uh, the poet Ronald Johnson, who was staying here at the time, we, uh, we got ourselves outfitted as best we knew how and uh, went down to Georgia, Springer Mountain, and headed toward Maine. And uh, that was an experience, as you can imagine. It was very important in my literary life because um, I got a whole new idea of what poems were. And uh, one of the things they are is uh, people talking. And I learned to listen very, very closely to what I was hearing out of the mouths of country people, kind of isolated people. And that taught me a lot about, uh, you know, taught me when to shut up. <laughs> and that's one of the problems that a lot of poets have. They can't stop jabbering away in a poem. You know, a poem usually has about three times more words than it needs. And uh, something I learned. And had, you been, had you been writing poetry before you went on this hike? Oh yeah, I started basically when I went to Black Mountain. I'd written a few before that, but uh, not under anybody's uh, eye. And uh, so I've been writing for, uh, let's see, 10 years. By which time I had, so to speak, uh, a voice that I thought was my own. It took me about five years to get out from underneath the, the bulk, the hulk of uh, Charles Olson. You know, it's enough to, you know, squash you. And... Uh, so I thought I had a style that was pretty much my own, and uh, uh, I, I wrote a lot of I wrote a lot of poems that summer, and uh, they, most of them appeared in a book uh, that Duke University Press published. Well, first it was published uh, in New York in the in the seventies, I guess. It was called Blues and Roots, Rue and Bluets, and. Uh, I'm very happy with, uh, with much of what's in that book still. 
You just have a new volume that's come out? Yeah, I mean, I've been very lucky in the last year or two. Uh, well, this is the new one. Can you see this? Or? Can you just hold it right? Yeah, right there, John. This is, this is a new and selected poems. There, there hadn't really been a proper one for years and years. And um, so this is 300 pages. And that title was? Jubilant Thicket. And then the book before this was another beauty. Um, this, is, this is a book called a palpable Elysium. And uh, my poet friend Robert Kelly said, uh, don't you know that you can't title a book a palpable Elysium in the America of 2003? He says, nobody knows what those words mean. He said, call it uh, honey in your hand. <laughs> so, a palpable Elysium. It's photographs. Can you just show us? Uh, yeah, I can show you. Let me see if I can find. Are they your photographs? Yeah, they are. As I say, I never particularly called myself a photographer, but I, I've always used uh, good cameras. Mamiya Flex or uh, uh, Hasselblad. And... Uh, that's a that's a photograph of Kenneth Rexroth, a San Francisco poet. This is back in 1954. So it's about I think there are about 80 pictures, and uh, it's an interesting record of what I've been interested in. You know, like people you've met, people, places. Uh -huh. Well, jargon was uh, something I started. Uh, at, at Black Mountain during the summer of uh, 1951. And um, one of the students there was uh, Joel Oppenheimer. And Joel was in Charles Olson's class, and uh, so I knew him kind of from the class. And I liked what he was doing. And uh, I got the idea one day of well, you know, we can't publish much and we can't publish anything big, but we can publish something. So uh, there was a poem of Joel's about uh, the dancer, Catherine Litz. Yeah, Katie Litz. Joel had this very beautiful little poem about her. And I thought to myself, well, we'll just make a four page. And Joel knew how to print. There was, there was an old print shop at Black Mountain. So he knew how to set type, and he could probably print the thing. So I asked um, Bob Rauschenberg, who was also a student that summer, if he had any drawings, or if he had a drawing that he thought might sort of fit into this project. And he gave me a handful of drawings, you know, take your pick, you know. So I, I picked one. and. I, he courteously uh, didn't ask for any money, or, but he was just a student then. I mean, this. So the, we have a drawing from Rauschenberg. It turns out to be the first time he was ever asked to do anything like that. So the last time I heard it was on view at the Whitney Museum in some big, uh, big show of his. But um, so we had this. So we had. The dancer, and we had Rauschenberg, and we had Joel, and I kind of designed it very simple, and we printed 200, and uh, each of us was given 50 copies, and then there was like 50 copies to sell, or give as you as you chose to students and faculty at the college. So, it's not as though jargon has ever been designed to make any money. We just mostly give it away and enjoy doing so. Anyway, Jargon Jargon has uh, always published maybe two to three books a year. That's all we could possibly afford because I had to raise the money by begging it, you know, from uh, this individual and that individual and small foundations and such as that. 
And uh, I don't know how we managed, but uh, we published 119 books, all of, them who, all of which lost money except uh, White Trash Cooking by Ernest Matthew Meichler. Where did you meet Ernie? Uh, somebody we knew in England uh, met him in Key West, and he was, uh, he was a cook. And they have a lot of gay guest house, houses in Key West, and he cooked for one or two of those. And he got kind of well-known, you know, somebody if you, to cater a party or something like that. And uh, this Englishman, whom we knew, uh, said, uh, Ernie tells me he has a, a cookbook ready. And by ready, uh, he meant that um, there were three by f uh, two by f two by five is it three by five cards in a bag, just a bag full of you know recipes. And uh, I said, well, let Tom Mark can maybe make sense out of this. And he kind of pulled it together, and he said, you know, this is pretty good. This is, uh, this is interesting. And then Ernie ch chimed in and said, uh, well, if you like it and you want to do it, I've got a lot of photographs uh, that you might like to look at. And I did like them. They were very kind of snapshotty, but uh, re really well composed, just simple photographs. And so we used a bunch of those. And uh, people couldn't buy it quick enough. Just amazing. So we had no experience with anything that sold, so we immediately had to sell it because we, we were engulfed, you know. We didn't know what to do. So we sold it to 10-speed, which is a very savvy operation out in Berkeley. And uh, they got to like the book a lot. Phil Wood, the guy who's the, uh, the main man at 10-speed, uh, was by here this, this well, recently, a couple of months ago. Uh, he said, that book is our, almost our favorite book, and it's one of our four best sellers over the years. He sells a lot of that book. But it shows you what uh, tenacity will do, if nothing else, you know. Well, I'm amazed how we did, I just, thinking back, I cannot figure out how in the world we managed to do that. But um, at this point in time, I'm, uh, I'm trying to get my own books uh, kind of in order and uh, doing pretty well in the last couple of years. Been about four, four books, including this uh, amazing little, little production that this is a small press in uh, Santa Barbara, Isla Vista actually, which is a suburb where the university is. and. Uh, Sandra Reese is this extraordinary printer. I mean, I don't know whether there's anybody any better in the country. This is uh, the title page. Can you see that? I think it's quite an amazing, amazing piece of work. I'm going to read you a few poems out of this book. Uh, Kinnikinick brand Kickapoo Joy Juice. And uh, what's in it uh, uh, is a series of uh, what I call metaphors, F-O-U-R-S. And uh, the principle is uh, each line has four words. I take away punctuation, capitalization. I take away just about everything. I think I leave the possessive, uh, whatever you call that. And uh, it does a lot of things. When it works, I really like it because it turns uh, sense into nonsense. And uh, at times you don't know whether you're coming or going. I, I, like, I like that. I like that the reader to experience that kind of thing. I'll read you a few. This is uh, courtesy of Raoul Middleman. So what did the, the Zen monk say to the hot dog vendor? 
make me one with everything. I love the story of when the young Bell of the Bluegrass, who had just barely survived his course on ancient civilizations, came up to Professor Davenport during a cocktail party at one of the horse farms outside Lexington and said, Professor Davenport, you are the most overeducated man I've ever met. <laughs> Gaze in the military. Gaze indeed. Far as I remember, the only difficulty I had was turning down career officers at Fort Knox, Kentucky, who would stop me walking back from the service club to the barracks at night and ask if I wanted to go to a hot party with really hot guys. So how's that grab you, Sam Nunn, you big pussycat? <laughs>